creating a 3D printable miniature for wargaming is a daunting task, but it's much easier than you imagine, and completely free. So today, I want to go over some of the basics to help you get started on your journey. I have only been designing my own miniatures for about a year now, teaching myself how to do it and documenting that process here on the channel. So I'm no expert, in fact, far from it. But here's the thing, you don't have to be. And since Blender, the software I use to make all of my miniatures, is completely free and open source, you really have nothing to lose. Even if you don't have your own 3D printer, if you're watching a video like this, you probably know someone who does, or are considering getting one yourself. So the best way to get started is to just start. Before working on your first model, or really anything specific, allow yourself the freedom to just play. Familiarize yourself with the software, how to move through the different panels and navigate menus, move objects around and manipulate them. I'm not going to be going over any of those specific details today. Plenty of other creators have covered it better than I could, and really, I think the best way to learn all of that is just to try. Instead, I want to focus on 3D printed miniatures specifically, the things that I wish someone had told me a year ago. So even though today's project is fairly simple, turning a basic cube into a single weapon, there are still a few things that I think you should know before getting started. So, make sure you're comfortable using a few simple hotkeys to adjust the camera, move, scale, and rotate an object, and do all of those things along the X, Y, or Z axes independently. Once you're familiar with all that, we can finally look at the first thing you should do to get started making your own miniatures in Blender. The setup. I know it sounds boring, but trust me, this will save you a ton of time and agony later on. The key here is scale. We want to make sure that we can go from sculpting to printing effortlessly. And that means we need to first make sure that Blender knows how big all these objects are. So for miniatures, we're going to use millimeters. In the Scene Properties tab on the right hand side of the screen, under Units, you'll see a few different options. First, make sure you select millimeters, but that's not all. You also have to adjust the unit scale to match the number you see here. Now, when exporting an STL, you shouldn't have to adjust anything. It's already set up. You can check your work by exporting a simple cube and putting it into a slicer next to a 28mm miniature. If you've done everything right, the cube should be about the size of that miniature's foot. Next, before we finish up, we want to install a few extra add-ons. Under Edit Preferences, you will see a whole list of these, and I believe they're all free. But today, we want to focus on just three. 3D Print Toolbox for double checking the quality of your prints before you export. Bool Tools for adding and removing parts of your object. And Rigify for rigging, but we'll get to that another time. Finally, we're going to save our default screen. I like to leave the cube but remove the light and camera, which can always be added back in later anyway. Then under File, you can just click Save as Default. Now, whenever you open up Blender, you'll be greeted to this same screen, with all the add-ons and the scale set and ready to go. Then you can just start modeling. For today's example, we're going to be working on a new weapon for one of my scavenger deckhands. This little hook here, which is perfect for scaling up these ruins or yanking your opponent towards you scorpion style. This gives us a relatively simple shape to work with that you can do with basic modeling tools not much sculpting required. I started out with a quick sketch. This is definitely not necessary, but don't underestimate the power of reference material. Also, you may have noticed that I'm going to be adding this onto an existing model, one of the deckhands from a previous video. But don't worry, you can mostly ignore it if you don't have a character made already. The steps are the same. First, we're going to add in a simple cube then move it into position if you're trying to match an existing model. While positioning your cube, keep in mind that the origin point, that little orange dot in the center, is going to become the pivot point of your entire object. So for a weapon like this, I like to make sure that ends up in the middle of the handle. 
don't rotate the cube yet. We want to take advantage of the x, y, and z axes as much as possible while we still can. But once it's in position, we can scale it up and down along different axes until we have the rough shape of a handle. For an object like this, I try to make sure it's at least half a millimeter thick, any thinner, and you're likely going to snap it off during support removal. Even that is pretty thin. I happen to be a big fan of this proportional style of mini, but keep in mind, anything you're looking at on the screen is going to seem much larger than it does on the table. So feel free to make these a little bit chunkier than expected. Once our object is roughly scaled, we can switch over to edit mode. Here we can adjust individual vertices, edges, and faces, giving us much more control. For a symmetrical object like this, we should now set up a mirror. Start by pressing Ctrl R to add a loop cut around the center of your object, then selecting only half of those vertices and deleting them. Once those vertices are deleted, we're going to add a mirror modifier under the modifier tab of our object. Then make sure that it's mirroring along the correct axis, in this case X, and check the little box next to clipping. To make sure both of these halves are actually connected together, check the little auto merge vertices box in the top right corner, it's kind of difficult to see, then select all of the verts on the center line and just move them along the x axis. They shouldn't actually move if you've done this correctly, but they definitely will connect together. With transparency mode active and our view aligned with the x axis, we can then select two vertices on the edge, which is technically four, and then begin to move it around. Then we can start to create the shape we want by pressing E to extrude that face. By default, this extrusion comes out perpendicular to the face you've selected, which is fine for now. With that new face selected, we can then rotate it and move it around to match our reference. Notice that when we rotate like this, the width of the bar will actually change. For now, you can fix it by just scaling it back down. Be careful though, if you do a basic scale, you'll actually be scaling down X as well, which will affect the thickness. So try to do it one at a time. We can then keep up that same process until we have the rough shape that we want, adjusting any vertices to match our reference. And if we need some few extra details, we can just extrude those out as well. And once you're happy with that side, move on to the pommel. Now that the profile is set, we can start to add in some depth with basically the same process. The only difference is we have to be a little more careful about the vertices that we select. You can select as many vertices as you like to do this, just make sure you're selecting whole faces. You don't want any extra verts tagging along from the other side of the model. They will come back to bite you. You can also select faces directly by switching the select mode, but I tend to prefer to stay in the vertice view so that I can actually see where all the points are, but that's really up to you. Keep doing this for all the parts that you want sticking out from the surface, like this little ring around the handle. Just remember that by default when you extrude it's going to come out in one direction, so for a ring like this we actually want to scale it instead. However, by scaling it, we've accidentally adjusted all of the different axes, so we might have to scale back one axis at a time until it matches the look that we want. Now, to finish off the modeling portion, we're going to cut a hole through the pommel. Now, there are a lot of different ways to do this, many of them faster and easier than what I'm about to show you, but this technique is really the simplest, plus it gives you a better understanding of how geometry itself works. Our goal here is to delete the center of this middle face, so first we have to delete the faces to either side. Then we can add a double loop cut, same as a regular loop cut, but press number two. Once we have that middle chunk, we can delete it as well and select those edges and extrude them back toward the center line. This gives us some extra edges which we can extrude out to start forming that central octagon. Now I actually made a mistake here, I accidentally added an extra vertice early on on the side panel, so I had to remake them, but no problem. We can just select four different vertices and press the F key to add a new face. Then keep doing that to close off the rest of the gaps, and 
be careful not to miss any. In order to print correctly, an STL needs to be manifold. That means it has a single, unbroken surface around the entire object. One whole, lonely vert or overlapping face can make the whole print fail. So, we want to be extra careful when doing this kind of modeling. That said, once you're confident everything is put together, you are basically finished. This model is good enough to print out and put on your table. People are hardly going to notice the lack of detail at this scale. So, good job. And all you needed was a few simple techniques. However, we're going to take it a step further and add some detail. There are two ways to add extra detail that I want to talk about today. We can add or remove other objects, and we can sculpt directly onto the model. I usually start with sculpting, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But before we can move into sculpt mode, there are a few things we should do to prepare our model. Sculpt mode in Blender basically works by just moving around the different vertices on your object. So if you want nice, crisp detail, you actually need a lot more vertices than we have now. That means we're going to need to subdivide our object. To subdivide cleanly, we actually have to apply the mirror modifier first. You can do this on the modifier itself by clicking the arrow and hitting apply. Easy. Done. Now, your object won't have any mirroring on it anymore, but we can always add it back in later if we want to. Now, you could just subdivide and start sculpting right away, but you'll quickly notice that some areas are going to look sharper than others. That's because some parts of your model have larger faces than other parts. So before we really start working on our sculpture, we have to go through and add a few extra loop cuts to make sure that all of the faces are generally the same size. This will make it a little more difficult to keep everything straight later on, so you should be pretty confident in your overall profile before doing this. Once that's ready, we're going to add in the multi-resolution modifier. This lets us essentially subdivide in layers. That way we can sculpt in high resolution, but still have a low resolution version for things like posing or when we are working on other objects. This single tool lets us save a ton of processing power, and I honestly don't think I could really do what I do without it. This is actually why the miniature here looks so blocky and weird because all of those pieces are on their lowest setting. Now, inside the multi-resolution modifier, we have a few options, but for a hard edge model like this, I just use the simple button. This will subdivide your model without actually moving anything around. The others are good to play with, but save those for more organic shapes or when you want to smooth something out. Finally, we're ready to head over to sculpt mode. Now, there is a lot to talk about here, way more than I can fit in this video, so I want to keep things really simple. In sculpt mode, we mostly use only two brushes, clay strips and grab. We can also press shift at any time to smooth things out, and we can press control at any time to invert the direction. This means that instead of adding clay strips, we would be removing clay strips. We can also adjust the size and strength of our brush. For an object like this, I like to keep it relatively small and soft, especially if you don't have a graphics tablet like I do. With all that in mind, it's time to add in some little dents and divots. This step is really fun, it's probably my favorite part of this whole process, but try not to get carried away here. Remember that once printed, a lot of this detail is going to disappear, so focus on things like big cuts or gashes along the surface that are going to be noticeable on a 3D printer. Okay. Now that we've had our fun, it's time to talk about the other method of adding detail, and that's with booleans. This is a very powerful technique for adding, removing, cutting other objects using a separate object. However, it is also very destructive, so I tend to save it for the end of my project. In this case, it's a very effective way to add little bolts on our hook here. So first I'm going to make a cylinder move it up and rotate it into position, scale it to just the right size, and then duplicate it across the object. With pool tools installed, we can now select first the object you want to add, then the object you want to add to, and then press shift Control b to bring up the menu. In this case, we should select Union. And with that, we are, in fact, finished. 
However, before we export this file, we do want to make sure that it is in fact printable. So go over to that 3D toolbox that I mentioned earlier, select the check all button, and just give it a second. Uh, at this point, we have a lot of different vertices, so it might take a little while for your computer to calculate everything. The main thing is that we want to see non-manifold edges zero. The other things are not as much of a problem. These are more about efficiency and about supports, but a lot of the supports we're going to be adding later anyway, so I don't worry about it too much. If you do have any non-manifold edges, it can be a little bit tricky to fix, but what I recommend is going into edit mode and just hitting G to move those selected faces so you know where they are. It can be a little difficult to see them sometimes. And then just going in and maybe if you're lucky, you can just delete them. If you're not lucky, you might have to close up that manifold hole, but it is in general fixable. If it's really messed up and you can't really fix it easily, then you may just want to remesh the whole object. Although that is a topic for another video. So hopefully it's all perfect. And now we can export support and print out our little hook. This is a simple weapon, but the techniques I used here are basically the same for all of the non-organic parts of my models. Sculpting, of course, is a bit of a different topic, but basically all of the weapons, all of the armor were made the same way. And now that you have this extra little weapon, if you're like me, you can add it onto an existing model, pose it up, maybe add a few more details and print it out. And once done, you have a nice new little miniature to add to your collection. And this little guy has now joined the rest of the deckhands over on my mini factory. So you can head over there to download and print him yourself. Plus, if you're watching this when it comes out, then we're in the middle of Black Friday sale. So everything in my store is 50% off. You can find the discount code down in the description below. Also, if you like this more in-depth tutorial style and would like to see me talk about other aspects of miniature design, like rigging and rendering, then let me know down in the comments and subscribe to the channel. Finally, if you'd like to know more about the game that I'm working on and that side of the hobby, you can check it out right over here. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.